In a typical computer architecture, we have a processor, and we have main memory. And whenever we need to retrieve data from memory, we make a request. And this animation is going a little bit slow, but that's for a purpose. In terms of computer time, it takes a long time to fetch data from memory, so much so that it will almost invariably adversely affect performance. It's eons of computer time which is why we can put a mini memory, that is a cache, inside a processor itself. So now when we want to fetch data from memory, and let's say we want to fetch the data stored here at address 145, we don't just fetch the value in memory location 145, we fetch the data around it, that is a block of data, and send that back to the processor to be stored into the cache. At any given time span, programs tend to heavily use data that is clustered together. So this ends up being an effective way to drastically improve performance. But we add an interesting wrinkle to this when we work in a multiprocessor environment. Here we have four processors, and each one has its own cache. And let's say P1 also needs the variable stored in location 145. This block of data, which has already been cached in processor 0, is now sent to the cache in processor 1. Moreover, perhaps processor 2 isn't asking for that particular variable, but it's using a variable stored nearby in the same block. Now the same block gets sent to processor 2 as well. So here we have a four processor system, and three of the four processors have cached the same block from memory. Everything hums along nicely until one of these processors has to perform a write on that data. For example, consider an instruction like this one. V gets the value of V plus W. Now if we take a closer look at this block. Let's assume V is stored in location 144 and W is stored in location 145. Now W is going to be just fine, but V has a new value. And this presents a problem because the other caches still reflect the former value. What we have here is one processor showing V being equal to its latest correct value, 105. But processors 1 and 0 who contain the previous value, 63. And computer architecture, this is known as stale data. To address the problem of stale data in multiprocessor systems, a number of cache coherency protocols have been developed. These protocols are designed to make sure that shared cache data stays coherent. That is, when data is read from a cache, the value returned reflects the latest value written to that variable by whatever processor performed the write. In the taxonomy of these protocols, there are two main ways cache coherency can be maintained and enforced. The first is a snooping protocol, and it takes advantage of how, in an architecture like the one I've depicted here, all the processes are listening in on a common bus. So when P2 writes over the variable V, that modified block can be sent back to memory. But as that transaction is happening, the other processors happen to be listening in on this same bus, or snooping. So P1 can exploit this communication and update or invalidate the data accordingly, as can P0. And so now all the caches have the same value as what is reflected in main memory, which is what we want. But this is only effective if all the processors are communicating on a common bus. So in, say, a hypercube, a snooping approach might not be so easy to implement. A second approach is to use a directory. Conceptually, it works like this. We add a directory to main memory, and this allows the system to track which blocks have been cached in which processors. For example, this block of data here hasn't been cached in any of the processors. The next block has been cached in three, uh, P0, P1, and P2. And this next block, we'll say, has only been cached in P3, and so the directory reflects that accordingly. So this time, when a block is modified and written back to memory, memory can be updated. But we also know which other processors have cached that data. So we can send messages back that will either invalidate those blocks or, as shown in this example, provide the most up-to-date value so that it can be written into the cache. 
those are the two most common approaches, snooping on a common bus or maintaining a directory. Now, I want to probe a little deeper to explain at a lower level how this might actually get implemented. First, let's assume our system is using a direct mapped cache. So here's a cache that can hold eight blocks. Over in main memory, we have lots and lots of blocks, but each one will get mapped into one of eight available spots in the cache. Obviously, it would be more than eight in a real system. For example, if we read from this block here, and I should point out, in the early part of the video, I was showing individual data stored in individual addresses. Here, each of these red rectangles represents a block, which might be, say, 8 or 16 words or even 64 words or addresses. So as I was saying, if P1 reads from this block, which is one of the many blocks associated with block 4 in a cache, then the processor will put that data in block 4 of the cache. Now, if the next cache miss happens to occur in this block, which is also mapped to block 4 in the cache, the previously cached data will need to be overwritten by the most recent cache miss. Fortunately, though, this isn't too likely to happen thanks to the phenomena of spatial and temporal locality. That is, if we read from this block, again, mapped to block 4, there's a high likelihood that subsequent reads are going to be done nearby. And that means the data will fill up the cache quite nicely. Now, I need to introduce the concept of state. Every cache block has an associated state. The states might vary from protocol to protocol. Some protocols might use three states. Some might use four. But these states help the processors know which data can be used and which cannot be relied upon as valid or coherent data. The protocol in the example I'm going to discuss has three states, which can be implemented with two bits, but I'm going to depict them here using a 0, 1, or 2. Remember, each cache block in each processor is going to have these state bits. And state 0 is the initial state used before any of the data has even been put into the cache. It means the data isn't valid, which is what we'd expect at startup. We don't expect the caches to be initialized with valid data. Now I'm going to put a whiteboard of sorts over the schematic so we can show how these state transitions work. But I'll leave a little bit of the architecture peeking out over the top so we can still work through an example. For this protocol, there are three states, invalid, shared, and exclusive. Shared means the cache data is valid, but it may be cached in other processors as well. So special care must be taken before we can write to that data. Exclusive means we are the only processor who has cached that data, so writes can be done more freely. And as we're going to see, we typically end up in the exclusive state when we write to a block, but in the shared state when we are reading from the block. So let's start with an easy transition, the read miss. The software begins running and we need to read something from main memory. We'll assume this happens up here near the first block zero. It's not been cached yet, so the processor will request that block of data now. And when the data is returned on the bus, it's written into the cache, much like it would be in a single processor system. But now, because we're dealing with shared data and working within the confines of a coherency protocol, we must also change the state of the cache block, in this case, from 0 to 1, which is what we've depicted in the state diagram. Now what happens if we encounter a read miss on a shared block? At first, that might seem counterintuitive. How do we have a miss if there's data already in the cache? Well, remember that aside about how direct mapped caches work. So let's say the next read happens here, also in a block mapped to block 0. Now we need to cache that data much like we did the first. In fact, in the same place as the cache as the first, but we're going to overwrite the previously cached data. That data was valid, but so is this newly cached data, so the state ends up remaining the same. The next transition is a CPU write. 
If this is a write miss, we'll need to request the data from main memory, or as the state diagram says, we will place a write miss on the bus. However, if it's a write hit, we don't need to request the data, but we still need to alert the other processors that may have cached that data to inform them that the data is about to become stale. Let's make this example a bit more interesting by putting some cache data in processor 0 before we deal with that write hit. So here we have data corresponding to block 0 in both processors P0 and P1. And we don't really know if this is two different blocks of data mapped to block 0 or the same block. But either way, it's going to pretty much work the same. Let's see what happens now in the case of that write hit. Look up at P1. It's just written that data into the cache. This will cause the state to transition from 1 to 2. But we also need to place an invalidation notice on the bus. Remember, all the processors are snooping on the bus. So P0 is going to see this invalidation broadcast. Assuming both processors indeed cast the same block 0, which would be discernible from the address tag in the invalidation broadcast, let's assume it's this one up here at the top of main memory, P0 will now invalidate its cache block because the data there is no longer coherent. Once a cache block is in state 2, that processor has become the exclusive owner of the cache data, so all read and write hits work pretty much like a cache would operate in a non-shared environment. Even a write miss won't cause a state change, and here's why. If we have a miss while in state 2, we must be writing to a different block 0 in memory, like this one. We'll fetch that block from memory. And during that write, any of the processors caching that block will invalidate their copy. Remember, they're all snooping. So we can remain in the exclusive state. However, in the case of a read miss, the state will change back to shared. We are reading yet another block 0. But because this is a read, not a write, there's no need to retain exclusive ownership of that block. Instead, we perform the read, cache the data, and change the state to 1. One other possibility. What happens when a CPU has a write miss from an invalid block? Well, because it's a write instead of a read, we want to obtain exclusive ownership. If, say, P0 has a write miss in block 0, it will perform the write. The write miss will cause the block to be cached. The block was in state 0, but we make this state transition, and all the snooping processors will invalidate their copy if they happen to have it in their cache. And P0 ends up with exclusive writes to the data. Omitted from the state diagram depicted here is the way a block can get invalidated when the snooping detects a write to a block that's been cached. So for the sake of completeness, we'll add these two more transitions into the transition diagram. These orange ones happen when an invalidation message has been detected or snooped on the bus. One more thing. I can't emphasize enough how this is just one example of a coherency protocol. A protocol designer has many choices that all boil down to design trade-offs, the number of states, whether or not the system will use write back or write through, whether the cache is direct mapped or not, whether a single cache is used for shared data and private data, or if there are layered caches or a dedicated cache to private data. Much like snooping protocols, directory protocols have similar state machines that have them keep track of which data is cached where with the end goal of communicating efficiently so that the chore of keeping data coherent doesn't create such a strain or bottleneck on the network that the performance benefits of caching are offset. Here's a few other examples of cache coherency protocols and how data is 
kept coherent. A computer architect is going to have many options on the table, and an optimal mix may depend on the underlying architecture and maybe even the expected use of the system.